Uh, I'm Kim Withers. I'm your track manager for this session. And uh, we have um, Mike Goff, who is a former leader of B-Sides Texas. Many of you probably already know him. So I'm going to let him talk about himself a little bit more, and I'm going to put myself off camera. Hello, B-Sides San Antonio. Well, here we are again for uh, another conference, another time. Clearly a different place. And hello, uh, shout out to Stephen and Fred and Mike McBride and Ryan Chapman. And if I missed your name, sorry, I didn't see a pop up in the uh, chain of stuff. So I am uh, Michael Goff. I'm a principal at NCC Group and founder of Mark malwarearchaeology.com and IMF Secure. I'm a blue team defender ninja, malware archaeologist, logaholic, and principal for NCC Group. I love properly configured logs. They tell us who, what, where, when, and hopefully how. I am also the creator of the Windows Logging Cheat Sheets, a series of them here, and Arthur, the attack remote threat hunting incident response tool based on PowerShell remoting uh, Windows incident response uh, capability within PowerShell and Windows. And I'm the co-creator of LogMD, the Login Malicious Discovery tool. You can see the little logo there. And also co-host of the incident response podcast when we hold those. And of course, former Besides Austin lead and Besides Texas lead with Michelle and uh, Cindy, whom I think several of you know. So why this talk? Well, to find the bad, right? We have to find the bad. Being an incident responder, we get caught up. Uh, we get called when things get pwned. Clients want us to know, want to know who, what, where, when, and how the pwn happened, and we all know why. It's for the money, right? Rain showed me the money. So what do we consistently see with our clients? How are they failing? Well, the three C's, everybody know what they are? I've done talks on this in the past, but uh, this is definitely a focus of uh, what our clients are typically failing at. The three C's are configuration, coverage, and completeness. Configuration is local audit logging, not optimally configured, whether it's a Windows box, a Linux box, a network device, a web server, email server, uh, Amazon, AWS, flow logs, for example, Azure Cloud, GCP, whatever. Uh, generally, things by default do not optimally log. Macs do a pretty good job by default, but a lot of other endpoints and, and devices do not, right? So that's what I mean by local audit logging is the device itself, is it configured to collect the right things or the things that tell you, right? In a, for example, Cisco uh, ASA device that's doing VPN, uh, you have to enable debug logs in order to get the ASA IDs that show the logins and the usernames and all that. Um, that's the kind of stuff we're most interested in when, when people are allowed to log in without uh, multi-factor. Uh, endpoint agents are not optimally configured. So I push out an endpoint agent, let's say a log collector. Am I telling it to collect the right logs or the right fi flat files to process? Uh, or is the configuration of an EDR agent optimal? Right? Is it sending it? Do we know that the device is reporting in? Coverage is the idea of that endpoints missing one or more agents. Uh, we often find that our clients have three, four agents deployed, and every client doesn't have all the agents, right? Or some of the log data, right? The data that I talked about in the configuration is not being forwarded to the console, meaning uh, you've got all your Windows Advanced Auto policies on, but your agent, whether it's Mac OS or Linux, you've got everything properly enabled, but the, let's say, Splunk Universal Forwarder or Beats client is not collecting all the, all the right things. And uh, of course, you, you know, it, also applies to endpoints cloud is the flow logs collecting so I can see the source IP address of where the attacker might be hit in the uh, AWS environment as an example. And then completeness is the tying of the two together of configuration and coverage. How do you know that every endpoint or device that is supposed to be logging and being collected somewhere by some console 
is actually verified, right? Is the configuration locally correct? Is the configuration of an agent forwarding correct? Can I see it? How do I know about net new? How do I know about uh, patches, updates, and things that might break it? For example, in Windows 10, when we get these new OS refreshes for non uh, group policy AD attached machines, Microsoft will reset all the security policies. So if you set all the fancy auditing, it actually gets unset. So things like that. How do you how do you go through that process? Because a lot of times these changes occur, uh, things get installed, things get updated. Uh, maybe the agent breaks in the course or doesn't start after it gets updated and it's locked. How do you check for this condition? That's what we consider uh, completeness. So when you roll out an agent, do you validate the agent was properly installed, right? Can you see it in the console? Compare it to a list of known assets, uh, let's say Active Directory where you're authenticating Mac and maybe Linux through uh, however you're doing it, um, LDAP, whatnot. You know, how do you know that all the assets are there? Are you comparing it to a network device list, IP scan, whatever? Uh, how do you know that all the assets are accounted for and in the systems? I worked on a project where management thought we were 90 plus percent deployed. It turned out when we actually manually went out and checked things, it was in the 60s, which freaked them out, right? SSEM, create a job, push stuff out to all the boxes. Well, SSEM doesn't do Mac or Linux, so how do you know you got to those unless you have something like Jam for, or the third party plugin for SSEM? Uh, verify the data is collecting properly, right? I've got 1,000 assets. Do I see 1,000 assets in the console? Uh, have a way to install agents on new systems. How's that process? When you do a net new gold build image, how do you know the agents on there? Uh, Big Fix is, an ex is a tool that I've used and mentioned in talks in the past. You connect it to AD, it sees any new AD uh, added device and pushes the Big Fix agent out automatically. Um, that technology seems to be lacking in our security consoles and that's, that's what we're looking for, right? Identify new system, automatically push out the agents, we're up to date, have a way to validate that. All right, and again, maybe the gold image comes up, but how do you install those agents? Do you have an SSCM, a JAMP, or something that gives you the information you need? Um, verify the endpoint configuration is showing up in the proper consoles, right, regularly. Do you audit those on you know, a quarterly basis, bi-yearly basis? How, how do you go through that process of making sure completeness is good? And we find a lot of our clients that uh, a chunk of their agents are, are broken, not deployed. Oh, that's a new system. We haven't got around to it. And, and that kills us in incident response because you know, we need that data. Right, and then of course, lather, rinse, repeat is the goal of completeness. This is a process that you must go through and do again and again and again. Uh, great, great uh, task for uh, interns and also uh, uh, newbies, right? Uh, get them familiar with that whole idea. So why are they important? Uh, incident responders need data to discover what happened to the detail level. We can be sure what happened and who did it. So our clients can improve and close the gaps of why pwnage happened or wasn't detected, right? We have to look at their environment, see what happened, why did it happen, where did it get caught, where didn't it get caught, uh, what was logged correctly, what tools did we use that allowed us to do it quickly, et cetera, et cetera, and then tell them, hey, you need to get these, you gotta come up the process to get these agents deployed everywhere. We found, you know, 20% didn't have them. <clears throat> and also, the goal here is to reduce the cost and time of an incident response investigation. It's always the goal. The better prepared you are, the faster we can respond to an incident, whether internally or a firm, and the data we can collect faster, which means we can react and potentially cut off the bad actor faster or stop the malware spread or whatnot. And then it can save you two to four times the cost of paying an incident response firm. For example, if you're optimally configured and you pass all the things that I'm going to talk about in this presentation, and let's say you've got a thousand node network and you, you suspect 10 machines are involved in some sort of compromise, I can quickly determine and assess in those 10 machines in easily a week to see where we're at and determine whether other machines are involved. If stuff is not configured as we expect, it can take two weeks, four weeks or longer. So it's definitely a cost savings for you. And then of course you can be way ahead if you prepare. You don't have to spend money to improve procedures and processes, right? It's, it's, it's free. People time is cost, but not an external spend. It's a allocation of resources, times, priority. 
So spend some time on preparation. It is the P in the sans pick a roll model, right? P is for preparation. Many of our clients have incomplete or broken agent installs and endpoint configuration is not optimal. So they're not collecting what we expect. This means that incomplete coverage and configuration and thus missing the details and potentially the initial compromise. We have investigated scenarios where a patient zero, one, maybe two, maybe even three, had none of the agents deployed, weren't doing a good job uh, measuring or looking or monitoring AV um, in the process of rolling stuff out and you literally had to go into forensics mode. And that's like a week per workstation or, or server. So that significantly increases the amount of time and cost to the engagement. A config fail example. So let's look at this perfect example uh, that came from a client. Uh, we checked the Windows system for what logging is enabled, right? 85% of the systems are still Windows out there. So it's pretty heavily uh, come across, especially as open and administrative the users tend to be. And so we checked them to see what the setting of the local logs are, or the local group policy, if it's group policy controlled, in order to determine what we can expect to see out of the machine. That very quickly will tell us to be able to tell the client, hey, we're not seeing this, this, and this. It's going to take longer, maybe, and potentially put in a change request. Uh, there's a free, freely available tool to check your Windows logs against some of the well-known cheat sheets. And I'll give you a hint. Look at the bottom of the screen on every slide. Right, LogMD will check it for you, I'm gonna say it's a free tool, and Malware Archaeology is a cheat sheet that it compares it to along with USGCBs and uh, cyber, uh, Aussie Cyber Standards and the CIS benchmarks. Log sizes are often not big enough on the local logs of a Windows box. Again, not every organization sends all their endpoints to a log management solution, so we have to very heavily rely on what's on the actual endpoint, whether it's Mac, Linux, etc. If you're not sending it to SIM, then I have to rely on what's on the endpoint. And log sizes generally fail. We have a, an expectation recommendation. These needs to be, some logs need to be a gig, a half gig at minimum, two gig if you're really getting into things like Sysmon, which you can see at the bottom of the screen, Sysmon's not detected. Uh, but I tell people roughly a week and a security, uh, a gig and a security log is about a week's worth of data. That means you have to break glass, run the triage before those logs roll and you lose what happened. And then it makes it much more costly. PowerShell is used in all kinds of attacks, commodity ransomware, APT, et cetera. The command line details are missing. This is where you can see net.exe executed, but you can't see what it connected to. And then, of course, PowerShell. Uh, you know, whether or not the power execution policy, this is not a security related item, but whether the policy is unrestricted, which means anything can run from anywhere, or remote restricted, which means it can run locally, but it can't be pulled in and run, uh, but also whether the most important, the module logging and the script pocket logging is enabled and collecting all the details of what happens in PowerShell. Another thing we commonly find is, is lacking and, and fails at our clients. Uh, audit settings. So this is the GPO, the group policy or local audit policies. And we see these uh, fail all the time. And this is the kind of stuff we want, right? Process creations means I can see a 4688 net.exe executing. And you can see in this case, it's not being tracked here, which means I will not be able to see the process executions of malware.exe or whatever else the bad guy uh, did on recon or anything else. All the lateral movement are crawling. So prevention, um, I'm going to get up on my B-side soapbox. I actually think we had a box of soap for B-sides at one point for, you know, all this cleaning and stuff we had to do. If prevention works so well, then why are we having more ponies than ever before? Can we change the term to something more realistic? Let's reconsider, let's consider it reduction, right? Now we can look at it, how we can reduce the likelihood of an event reduce the effort it takes, reduce the time it takes, reduce the damage in the case of ransomware or, or uh, malware and taking off the, the your data. And of course, reduce the costs, et cetera, right? It's all about reducing because you're not gonna prevent anything. If you think prevention works, then why is everybody still getting pwned? Threat hunting, it's all the rage, uh, but before you can do threat hunting and expect to actually find anything, you need to solve the three C's and have one or more methods or solutions to hunt with. So Clients will ask us, hey, can you threat hunt? And we'll say, well, let's go and, and check out your capability. And we find they're not collecting the right logs. So if I was to crawl machine to machine to look for things, it wouldn't be turned on. They're not sending all the endpoints to a SIM. I mean, there's all kinds of combinations of things. They have an EDR, but the EDR only shows process execution, post exploit. Remember, you install an EDR on a machine after it's been exploited, you're not gonna see the actual initial exploit. It only records from that point forward. <clears throat> 
right? So there are fancy EDR threat hunting solutions. Uh, you can use a SIM, you can use a local tool like Arthur and go machine to machine, machine with WinRM. You can use Jamf, you can use Big Fix. There's, you know, all kinds of things you can use. Uh, or better yet, of course, log solution of, of your choice, whether it's anything from Elk to Humio to, to Splunk to whatever. Uh, and of course, they have to collect the right things, right? We need to be able to see authentication. We need to be able to see network traffic IP sources. So for example, if I've got load balancers and they're natting the, IP, the actual external source IP to the internal server, when I look at the internal server, all I see is the load balancer IPs. That doesn't tell me where they're coming from. And to be able to correlate the load balancer to the actual server is next to impossible. So unless you've got the XSF turned on uh, where you can do the, the translation of the IPs, it's a very difficult task, right? So the right things are very important. Our clients want to do it, right? They want to do threat hunting, but the data is not enabled or being collected that is needed to perform any decent uh, hunting. Same goes for incident response. You need the data or we can't do the best job as fast as we like, right? Time is money. The longer it takes, the more money it costs you, whether it's NCC doing the work or whether it's your internal people doing the work. You know, they're going to take longer, thus internal dollars. So what are we seeing out there? Well, lack of process details. Why is EDR uh, better than antivirus? Well, one uh, process details, by the way, is the process execution, right? The daemon that executed and what the parameters of that, of that execution are. Uh, one thing uh, EDR looks at things like the parameters, right? The you know dash whatever net use whack whack server name whack share name, and, and of course you know the uh, the parameters are where all the bad good stuff for IR people lie. The details tells us what the bad actors are actually doing, and I'm going to show some examples of that. And EDR falls short on some of the details as it tends to be execution based. Some have network communications as well, but they don't have auth. They don't show the user crawling from machine to machine, machine to machine. They they would have to create a uh, a policy violation that a, that the EDR has to say, hey, you're doing this weird thing with WMI. You didn't execute anything. You're just like reconning, but this is kind of odd or PowerShell, and it would trigger that a rule. But there's so many ways around EDR. Just ask any read teamer about how they get around EDR. Some clients do have EDR, right? And so what do we see with that? Uh, is it stopping the attacks? No, for the very reasons of the three Cs. We often find the configuration was inadequate. Um, we see it stopping part of the attack, but it wasn't configured to stop other parts of the attack. We saw an attack, for example, that caught a payload being dropped and it did not stop an execution of Tor. It was not configured properly to detect Tor and stop Tor but it did catch the uh, actual malware, uh, the Cobalt Strike malware payload. And again, you know, will I get all the details I need to investigate? Some EDRs I've used, I'm sorry, but no. I had a DerbyCon talk about that. You can go research on Iron Geek's website. Um, authentication is not common in EDR solutions, and that's a big part of our story. If, Bo if bad Bob logged in or bad Fred or bad sciatic nerd logged into a machine and jumped to 20 other machines, whether it's just a recon, whether it's just to dump the program files directory or program files x86 directory or the user's home directory, you know, slash user, slash bin, slash sbin, whatever, all I'm doing is recon to see what's installed in the box. A lot of these solutions will miss that. Right, so you have to you have to take into account what some of these EDRs can and can't do, and the bad guys are research stuff before they figure out or decide on what they're going to do to bypass it. Like we saw with uh, SolarWinds with the DLL sideload injected thing, no nope, EDR caught that because the DLL wasn't necessarily bad, and the comms are going to Amazon. So again, none of that was a known bad combo. Uh, we also see uh, clients using antivir multiple antiviruses. Some of this is due to acquisition. Some of this is due to migrations. But I've had a client with four AVs in a box. And not only does that pollute your logs, it creates a lot more noise. It then also uses up a SIM license. And, and so you really need to get this, this kind of these tool sets refined down. If you're going to migrate, then have a project to go uninstall all the other tools and rely on the one tool in the one console to make it easy to research and, and respond to.
right? Even better yet, if you can send the alerts to a, a SIM, even better. Not real noisy, highly effective, and highly uh, desirable, right? Uh, some of the AV solutions will require you to put special connectors to pull your data from a database into log management. That can be problematic. It's not easy like a local Windows log. But Microsoft Defender, for example, um, now that's Microsoft Defender, not Windows Defender, because now they have Defender for other OSs. Microsoft Defender has a log, and inside that is all the effort. And we've actually seen Defender, who which was accidentally left on, purposely left on, but the client wasn't watching it anyway, wasn't using a central console. And we found artifacts of the attack in Defender logs, but nobody was looking at it. So if there's a local log available, then use it, right? Figure out how to collect that data. Uh, Silence, for example, writes the application log, uh, if you so configure it to do so, um, which is really easy, because then you can suck those alerts into SIM, right? If it's not malware, then there won't be an alert. And so in Defender, definitely look for 1006, 1009, 1116, 1117, 1119 events. will tell you that I found malware, uh, I took some sort of action, and here's the action I took, and it's complete or not. Sometimes it says, hey, I got malware, but it could not actually clean it. Because again, the malwareians know how to uh, screw with this stuff. But we find these events all the time in doing endpoint security reviews, the triage on boxes, and no one collects these logs, but yet somehow it was on. Um, only created when it finds something, so low noise, high return, if you collect an alert on them. We find uh, one or more systems see a piece of the attack in the defender logs, but no one looked, so it was missed, but we found it during our uh, uh, triage scenarios. But be sure to uh, go to track three in the clouds and post any questions you have. Ransomware. Have you heard of this new attack? Oh my gosh, it's the latest. I mean, nobody's seen this, right? Of course, everybody's seen it, and extremely expensive lately with uh, JLP and uh, and the pipeline and, and all kinds of people that have suffered from the attacks. Most are due to passwords being compromised and then logging into internet-facing systems. Two-factor, anybody? I think Microsoft, I did a presentation where I showed the stat of Microsoft and also Ponymon Institute, where they said, uh, in Microsoft's case, 99 point something percent of all attacks originate on Windows boxes or some sort of organization based on a compromised password and lack of two-factor. And they, they say over 90% of attacks could be, could be uh, avoided, reduced, if you just use two-factor. I would completely agree with that because we've investigated a lot of those. Some of the uh, uh, ransomware attacks, for example, are email payloads or links, URLs, click on this, yada, yada, yada. Right, detection is very poor. People don't know how to detect the, the events because they're not running a good AV or centralized AV or, or doing a good job with AV, updating the policies, the latest stuff, um, EDR, et cetera, things with ransomware protection uh, just not being used. The built-in Microsoft uh, ransomware protection file encryption stuff is, is not deployed in our clients, right, if you played with that in your home system where it isolates your data into a bucket that the uh, OS can't see. Um, detection is uh, is very poor, but also solutions that detect or stop mass encryption is not presence. Thus, why clients are getting wiped out and their backups. So, you know, that's a big fail we see, and, and that really needs to be addressed to be able to detect these attacks and learn and have a process to pull the plug. Uh, we had a client where they turned everything off. Well, a lot of times the ransomware will push out to a startup. So when they powered it up, then the box got ransomware. I investigated one of those a couple of years back, and that was exactly what happened. So when they turned the machines off, we're like, uh, don't turn them back on. We're finding the malware starts in the startup script. So again, we have to uh, understand sometimes maybe just pulling the internet from the company is a good uh, incident response tactic for short term. But the devil's in the details. So let's talk about the details. Lateral movement. All right, again, if you have the data properly configured, you see lots of cool stuff. If you don't, you see what's up in the, up the right-hand corner here. Uh, from the host being investigated, we see a bunch of sysfile64.net.exes. That's never good. Uh, the bad guys use lot, several movements. This is just one of them. I'll talk about another one here in a minute. Uh, net.exe and net1.exe, right? If you see 20 of these net.exes in the logs, great, something's going on, right? Because if you do something like in Splunk, stats count by process, uh, new process, uh, uh, name, you'll see a bunch of these and you can count them. If I see, you know, more than, you know, five net.exes in an hour, maybe something funky's going on. But there's no details here, right? So as an incident responder, I look at this and say, eh, they connected uh, 20 systems. I don't know where, because you're not collecting details. 
So if you did do the details, and in this case, turned on process command line in the Windows logs, uh, again, EDR would provide this to you if, uh, if it was tracking this kind of thing as, a, as an event, not as normal. You would see not only what server or workstation, what share, SMB or otherwise, Linux, Mac, Windows, doesn't matter, you know, a share is a share. And the process command line will show you net.exe, whack, whack, secret server, slash credit cards, right, your, your secret data, and the super user, right, super domain user is the user, and Stephen Fred is the password. You would see this in the logs. And so that's a really powerful thing for an incident responder because it, it shows me the target. It allows me to communicate with the client or the owner of that data and say, is there anything important on this thing? Is this a, you know, a, a potential breach reporting scenario, right? So it immediately tells me something that I can work with the client. Not to mention if they did this 20 times, I can see the 20 systems that they connected to. So now imagine there's 20 of these, you know, what would you know? You know what systems were connected to, what shares, uh, thus, what data was exposed and possibly taken, uh, and then would direct you to say, let's look for data exfil from that box if possible. Uh, what users accounts got pwned, because you can see the username and password in there. And as a response, as an incident responder, I now have more targets to investigate because I know they logged into these systems with a network type three uh, remote share. So save your sanity, time, and job. If you collect the details, we can investigate minutes or hours versus days. This equates to real money since time is money. And in Nixon Mac OS, you know, it's the history command, right? This is the equivalent to process command line. I can see all the things that the bad actor did. You know, is this being collected? Is it being protected? Is it being sent to a SIM in some way, form, or manner, offline, AWS uh, uh, S3 bucket, uh, you know, into a syslog server, I don't care how, but somehow protect this data for some longevity of, of a few weeks to a month, 90 days would be optimal, but for sure get it lo logging locally, all right? Give us something our triage scripts can find. More on lateral movement, let's talk about WMI. This is also done and used quite frequently because there's no WMI logging in Windows. And WMI can be used for, you know, all kinds of performance related stuff and the bad guys can execute things, right? So we saw something like this happen where WMIC slash user, a foreign domain, admin, password, password, node, you know, whatever the node is, group list brief. So it's telling, hey, give me a list of groups, right? Recon. This is kind of the stuff that you may not see trigger in EDR, but it's very clearly bad in nature. So what we're looking for specifically is the user and password flags here for WMI. And with uh, remote WMI connections, uh, there is a unique dual authentication of Windows 10. So if it's a Windows 10 going to Active Directory, you can look for these two authentications. And it's a dead giveaway that there is some remote WMI execution happening against a box. And I did talk about this in my DerbyCon 2018 presentation. So go to Iron Geek's website to see more about this dual auth scenario that is unique to WMI. Windows Remote Management, WinRM, PowerShell Remoting. Talked about that as well earlier. Uh, Arthur's based on it, very powerful. Unfortunately, if you don't use the Windows Firewall, securing it is not not uh, not an easy task. You have to use the Windows Firewall to secure it. Uh, but it's very powerful. I can use the entire extent of PowerShell and any other utility that's on the box, right? So it's a great way to remote into a box, do recon, run a bunch of PowerShell commands, run a bunch of local commands, get the data back, and see what I'm looking for. And generally, if it's just standard executions, EDR is not going to see this stuff. Um, just enable it, and away you go, right? So are you monitoring for the enablement of a, of a WinRM session, for example? This is a bit different, right? As we need to collect a different log. This is a Windows Remote Management Operational Log, and it's in the Application Services Log, same place that the PowerShell Operational Logs are at. It's under, under Microsoft Windows uh, Application Services Logs. Lots of logs in there that are really good to look for. Uh, you do need to configure the endpoint, and we did see this occur in an attack where the bad actor got onto a box and realized, hey, I can enable WinRM and sent out WinRM remote configs using WMI and configured WinRM to work and then crawled across a bunch of boxes with it. Again, told us the data in that log of the machines they went to, and that was really awesome. Right. And then, of course, they can use PowerShell and all the things that come with PowerShell. And if they downgrade, then the PowerShell logging is even more difficult. So you better have good PowerShell logs. Right. But what about WinRM logs? What about PowerShell logs? Whoops. I just hit a serious button. Bink. So here's what the typical events look like with a WinRM operational log. Um, 
you're looking for two event IDs, ID6, host attacker, and 91, the target, will give you a list of systems that are connected to. So if you just looked at ID6, you're going to get all these lists of all the machines they connected to. This is pretty powerful. We collect this stuff with LogMD. I recommend people collect it in their SIM because generally, if this is not using your environment, then if it is used, hey, a bell should go off and alarm should go off. And so this is very valuable in regards to the data that it can tell a potential attacker. Or for us, incident response in triage is about eliminating, well, they didn't use this. Okay, well, they didn't use that. And allows us to, to narrow our focus about what we're looking at. PowerShell has logs as well, event ID 4104, which is in PowerShell v5, 6, 7. Uh, hopefully, at minimum, upgrade your stuff to PowerShell v5 with .NET 4.x. You need that's a requirement for older OSs, 7, et cetera, 20, 2008 server. Um, but a 4104 will show you the PowerShell blob. The 4103 will show you the details against the target system. So both of these entities are very powerful at determining what happened. In this case, on the bottom of the screen, you can see a 4104 event, and you can see that I did a Windows remote session, enter PS session, Defender, and auto-negotiate credentials, and I fed it credentials. And this tells me immediately this was a WinRM session in PowerShell. right? So if you're not using WinRM, they can still enable it and utilize it something we have seen being used, uh, oddly more now than before. So what about the network? How about traffic from servers? This is something that's really missed and sometimes very obvious to find attack. Back to the EDR missing some stuff. So we had a we had a scenario where the client thought that since they rolled out their EDR, they were good. Any box that had it would have triggered. And then I go through and decide I'm gonna I'm gonna verify the machines we knew were involved. I'm gonna dump all the communications to them because they're internal servers, which means their external comm should be very limited to very well known sources. And it was six, eight, twelve different places. And then suddenly all these weird ports and IP showed up. And what we found was Tor was running on a handful of boxes, either as a com slow comm channel, another backdoor, whatever they were using it for, you'd have to ask the bad actor. Um, but again, port 4443, 9001, which is very typical, 9030, 9040, 9050, 9051 are all very typical Tor ports. But we found 9001 and 4443 running on internal servers, as well as 80 and 443, two external IP addresses that were clearly not of typical business use. And that's how we identified that Tor is running and that configuration of the three C's failed because the client had not enabled the EDR to detect this particular portion. Um, and as well as during our investigation, we found some of these endpoints weren't in EDR and the agent was seemingly there but not running and it was actually broken and locked because they had not done the completeness check. Um, and again, the countries and the network owners of the Alpine IPs are gonna tell you a lot. You know, yes, uh, I'm not gonna worry about AWS, I know, I know, SolarWinds. Uh, but for the most part, again, what do you know about your servers and what are they communicating? If your servers normally don't communicate with AWS, then of course that wouldn't be an exclude list. And then if it started talking to AWS, you'd ask the question, why is this now talking to AWS? Um, so things like that will really help in doing this. And this who is information uh, is really handy. We tend to dump uh, network logs and local logs, firewall logs, and anything we can get, uh, AWS logs, flow logs, and we run it through we have, a, we have a tool in LogMD that lets us mass process who is lookups uh, to get this information to be able to say, okay, sort, you know, filter out, boom, 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 boom. Let's investigate these IPs and see if they're of interest. So once we do find a bad IP, we can look across the board and say, who else visited that, right, by collecting the data from a firewall log, for example. And so again, uh, we find our clients don't have a good baseline of normal traffic. And in these servers, we investigated internal servers. There wasn't a lot talking outbound. So the bad stuck out. Uh, once we started looking at them uh, within the, the time frame, once we had a window to look at, right? So where do you start? Well, in the SANS pick a roll model, the last item is lesson learned, right? So apply post-mortem to pre-mortem. We, in every engagement, this is what this is, the lesson learned, but I'm sharing it now, feeding it into your pre-mortem. And we basically call this a capability assessment. So the idea here is what is my capability in responding to an incident or threat hunting, um, right? Our capability to detect, I'm not saying prevent or block, detect an attack and respond quickly, right? Do I have the things properly set up? Am I collecting the right things? Are the agents deployed everywhere? Am I certain that we're in the 90 percentiles of coverage uh, so that I can, and I have a process that's checking the completeness and I know my net news not making my numbers drop down, 
right? Do I have an idea how long the data is collecting for? So if an event does occur, I better reserve that data, offload it, or break class in order to get the people on board before that data uh, rotates, right? These are all the things that we look at in a capability assessment, and we find these, these failures in our clients, right? We're trying to get them to avoid the bad ransomware events as well as is being able to respond quickly, uh, more quickly and cheaply and, and improve their security along the way. Right, you have to understand what data you have and how long it's collecting for. Uh, you will need to break glass with an IR firm or your own internal IR before this data rolls or a process to reserve that data, right? You have to protect it, right? And then uh, offload that somewhere, syslog, copy, whatever you need to do. Uh, run, you know, run a tool like LogMD or a, or a collection script that will preserve those logs uh, every three, four days, whatever it is that your retention and rollover might be, so that you can then feed it to us and say, hey, I, I, I we took us two weeks to get the glass and the contracts, but I've been rolling the logs off and, and for the last two weeks, every three days, because we retain for about five, and so you should have all the data you need. That's That would be awesome. Uh, and it's pretty rare for our clients, but that would be something you should definitely consider. And you do this to yourself, right? Or hire a firm like NCC Group. And, you know, shameless plug there. But by doing a capability assessment, you can determine if the log data you have is adequate for incident response and also threat hunting. If you want to go for threat, do threat hunting, you got to have the data. There's nothing worse than telling a client, I didn't find anything. And they're like, oh, great. No, you don't understand. We have a finding. And the finding is you aren't collecting the right things. And if there was something there, we couldn't see it. So we want the right data there so we can tell you, yes, we see the right data. And no, we didn't find any misuses of WMI, for example. No, no odd W mix, no parameters, no things like that that we saw. No net users going to a bunch of servers by one user, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right, that's the that's the idea. And again, uh, right, you can use a well-known framework to map what you have or should to detect well-known items used by the bad actors. Uh, we, we know that there are some great frameworks out there, one of which I'll mention here. Uh, you can track the progress of what you're collecting, create playbooks or runbooks as you verify your sources. Okay, we have a malware event and we have a way to look at the windows of NIDs that Michael talked about so we can set that up on our SIM because we are collecting that. It's not a lot of data. It doesn't have a big hit to the license, hardly has any hit to the license if nothing's happening. But if something does happen, boom, right? So I can, I can do a playbook and say, did you get an, a, a defender alert? Uh, yes, okay, do this, you know. That sort of thing. And of course, MITRE ATT&CK is the framework I would recommend people taking a look at. It is extensive. It now has sub-techniques, so it's much more detail. A couple hundred uh, different techniques and sub-techniques. The sub-techniques are the indicated by the dot zero zero six. Uh, main technique is the 1047, right? And so here's some examples I've talked about thus far. Remote service, WRMN, uh, WinRM, 1047, WMI, 1059.001, command scripting interpreter, in this case, PowerShell, 1218, signed binary proxy execution, aka low bins, low bass, et cetera, right? So you can map to say, do my tools detect this? Or have I enabled these logs? Can I see them? Or have I forwarded these to the SIM? And it can, it can really help you develop a roadmap of the technical controls that you can improve upon. So watch for downloading lull bin and lull bass. This is another thing you can do, right? This is heavily used by you know, run DLL32 to execute, uh, for example, DLLs. Uh, in SolarWinds case, obviously, they used a real binary that's loaded a, a DLL that was called by the actual binary. So you know we call the side loading. Uh, but a lot of cases, the bad actors will just use a run DLL32, register 32, go fetch it from the internet, pull it down, execute it. And these things can be quite telling. EDR does a pretty good job with this stuff. Uh, but there are some combinations, uh, for example, some EDRs do a very poor job of the um, uh, control panel applets because they're so normally noisy that they don't record some of these. And it's a technique ID within MITRE ATT&CK that you should definitely monitor for because red teams love to use it. They love to drop DLLs into, say, WebEx and use your own tools to launch a DLL to gain uh, uh, to gain access to the machine, all kinds of stuff like that, right? There's all these other things that EDRs just generally won't do unless it's a known bad signature and they can do a hash lookup and send it out to their cloud repo and, and pop you up a, a command if it's cobalt strike or something. Um, again, alert on these for sure. There's a short list of them. Uh, go to Mauer Archaeology, you can see a list of them. There's a project, the Lowell Best Project. Uh, and baseline the normal, right? There will be many normal ones. So get those combos again, process command line will give you what's normal, filter those out exactly by the entire command, and then watch for any new ones. 
right? Command process command line is detail and is key here. And here's a short list of them from according to Cisco Talus. Uh, again, process command line is going to be able to tell you what they are, and be sure to uh, go look at the Lobas project, Olaf Hartung's uh, project. Oh, not Olaf's. Uh, uh, had him on the podcast. Anyway, go look or listen to our podcast. We had the, the creator of that on. Um, but here's a short list that uh, Cisco says they see mostly. And I already talked about PowerShell. I mentioned Register 32. Bits admin's going away, but a slash transfer is what you're looking for there or other commands. Cert utils, another one that can do hashing and all kinds of cool stuff. And of course, MS, uh, MSHTA was heavily used in the Kovter attacks back in the day. Um, right, process command line is the key here. And look at MITRE ATT&CK to make sure you have coverage here. Uh, watch your traffic. It's time to set up some basic network monitoring as a part of Security 101. Man, I used to say network do that last, but it's becoming to the point where uh, so few people monitor any kind of outbound traffics of internal servers that it's really something you should do. So alert on all 80443 ports from internal servers. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. What about mail? What about, yeah, right? So 53 DNS, 22 SSH, 25, 465, 587 mail, 1433, 3306 for, for uh, uh, database servers, of course, whatever's normal on that server in your environment. Anything outside that going to the internet, right, is what you're looking for here. If you got a bunch of 22 traffic going to the internet on an internal server, you should question what the hell, um, et cetera. If it's not an email server and it's using these ports, what the hell? <laughs> so uh, look at that kind of scenario, right? What's normal? You know, is it going to expected places and then set up alerts? And you just pick a server, start with it. Of course, Ones with the data that you're most concerned about is where you should start. It's all about the data dummy, right? Keep it simple. Um, keep it the kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. So look at the ones that have the data, the most uh, valuable assets, and and work your way from there outbound to all the other servers, right? But servers should be a big win here. You should be able to baseline non-internet facing servers. The next step is to then use something to allow you to look at. Uh, the data about those IPs that are communicating, right? The who is information, and then don't trust them out or, or exclude them as an exclude list or a lookup list in Splunk, for example, um, that look by the IPs. Oh, I'm not going to go to 54 dot blah, 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 blah. No, do it by the entire cider. Make your life simple because stuff does shift left and right in cloud providers, especially Amazon. They have a lot of IPs, right? So just whack them all together. You'll hopefully trigger an Amazon-based, you know, SolarWinds attack another way. Um, but again, servers should not be overly complicated for this outbound traffic. Of course, internet-facing servers are a bit more different. Create a procedure to look up country and network owner, right? Watch this kind of information. Here's an example, LogMD doing a, a network lookup at a 52 address, which is Microsoft Corp. And then I can add the CIDR to a lookup list that says, I'm good, I think I'm good, or I'm generally not the droid I'm looking for. And I can make sure these don't show up and I get the list shorter and shorter and shorter till eventually I have a baseline and then I can watch for stuff after that. And just have a, a run book and a playbook, run book or playbook to follow to then validate that IP and then add it to the lookups. Another great task for SOC and or uh, entry level of person to do as a part of a daily job, right? And that's, the, and, and in course of any engagement, we will process tons of IPs. We'll take your firewall IPs, we'll take your endpoint IPs, we'll take your, your cloud IPs, et cetera, and we'll do this to them because it, it can sometimes lead us to the, to the bad. You know, how many internet facing devices had remote vulnerabilities that got pwned in the last year or two or last couple of weeks? Citrix and F5, and I mean, the, the list goes on. It is time to make sure logging on internet facing systems are collecting locally at a minimum. These should be high priority now with the fact that if you're not using two factor authentication, this is a huge risk to you. This is where ransomware is nailing companies. I throw a vuln in a box. It's not so much that the, the log has something in it. It's usually the structure of that log entry is tend to be long with all the manipulated data they have. Um, when they hit these boxes, uh, now we have one with uh, Citrix ESXi going on, right? So uh, get that stuff into some local collected way with some length of time and understand that if it's internet facing. It's very important, right? I want the source IP. Where did the person originate from? And of course, the you know, country origin is important. I want all the who is data, the owner and everything else. And of course, bad guys will use US hosting companies in our case. Uh, but again, should uh, one of these US server hosting companies be talking to my servers? Hopefully not. And of, of course, the authentication information is critical. Who? Bob. Okay, what's what do we know about Bob? What do we know about uh, bad Fred and bad, bad Steven? 
So the conclusion is learn from these typical failures, uh, configure all your logging, cover all your assets, verify completeness. This is a big one. Uh, we are just seeing our clients fail miserably at this. They, they think they got everything rolled out and we go start looking around and we find failures all over the place. Right. Uh, of course, in Windows, there's some cheat seats and Mitre Attack is definitely your friend. So uh, with that, I will take questions on the forum and here's the resources and it's good sort of talking to you. I can't see you. I'll wave at you. Uh, but it's it's good that we're getting these cons back and I, I hope to see you in person uh, sometime soon and and uh, give you a fist bump. And uh, I guess cons are going to be much different in the future. But let me know if you have any questions. Of course, go download the cheat sheets. They're free. LogMD is free. Uh, you can go check that out and, and do some of these things to your Windows side. And then, of course, same logic applies to Nix and Mac and, and do the same thing. Same thing applies to, to uh, cloud, email, et cetera. You know, do you know where the logs are? How long are they keeping the data for? Are they rolling, et cetera, et cetera. So with that, send me some questions. Thank you for your time and attendance today. Okay, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mike. That was great. Great talk. Got some great nuggets in there. Um, yeah, so I'll have to take that back to my class as well, some of those nuggets. Yeah, you, you, you go teach that. Because <laughs> Michael said so. The three so. C's. The three C's. I'm going to tell them. But, the three but don't C's listen to that other Michael, that, that McBride guy. You know, he's a, he's a web app, he's a web app security guy. Okay. Yeah, I won't listen to him. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, does anyone else have any questions for Mike on here? I will be uh, monitoring the Discord channel for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And of so, course, if you can't find me, hint bottom of the screen, you shouldn't be an infosec. <laughs> <laughs> just, just saying. Oh, sent, oh, sent, baby. <laughs> Oh, yes, I have right. a crowd. I have a crowd. They're laughing and everything. One. So funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you have any questions for him, get in the Discord chat and uh, send him some questions if you don't have the questions right now for him. And so I Director, guess yes. we will call this uh, session over. I will post um, this on uh, uh, it's owned by Microsoft now. The slide share and post to malware archaeology. So if people want to download this for reference, they can. I'll also, okay. uh, you want me to drop a PDF here? Yeah, if you could. Yeah, okay. that'd be great. Yeah, mm -hmm. I can do that. I'll do that right now. File, save as. Besides statics, PDF. Somewhere in here. PowerPoint, where are you? PowerPoint, PDF. There we go. PDF. Incident response fail. Besides SADX 2021 underscore. Save. All right. Where do I click on the plus? Let's see here. 20 point. SADX PDF. Done. Upload. All right. There you go. Let's see how simple that was. <laughs> yes. I'll walk you through it too. <laughs> yeah, it's step by step. <laughs> How to save PDF. Right. Okay, let's see. You got... All right, somebody asked, did. Uh, uh, yeah, some, oh, yeah, somebody's not looking uh, at the questions uh, box. Where the heck's the question box? Oh, here it is. Yeah, top three. Okay, so I see yes, I saw a response. Have you seen Have attackers? Seen yeah, you can read it if you want. Yeah, uh, how, have you seen attackers learning to recon from logs about what is normal? No. The, the hackers generally just don't pay any attention to logs. It's, you know, it's like, I used to hear an argument. I don't want to collect process command line because you might see my command line username and password in the logs. Well, one, the logs roll. Two, I should find it before the bad guys do so we can get it corrected. Stop using slash P colon whatever, pipe it in a proper way, use the credential of PowerShell, the dollar credential uh, variable, et cetera. Um, so we should find that 
remediate it so that we can set up a detection and then act upon it. So no, I don't. Um, in the low bins uh, that the host is normally, yeah, that's you just have to look at the low bins, see what's being normally used, and say this whole command line. Don't say not register 32, because it's what happens after that. You know, HTTP colon whack 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 bad site payload. Yeah, that's what you want to catch. So take the normal, put that in an exclude list, and say not this, not this, not this, not this, and eventually you'll see the bad low bins. And you can do uh, tests, right? There's some just literally make up stuff. I've got a couple test scripts for PowerShell, for example, to make sure they're detecting base 64 decoding. And I, it just says something malicious happening. And we just want to look to see that it triggered, right? So you can do the same thing with all these low bins. You can literally just type dash garbage, 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 enter. And then it will show up in the log and then you can trigger on it if you have a solution to do so. So what procedures should be followed to set up the baseline, assuming the attacker is already in? Uh, you might whitelist, or in this case, exclude a malicious pre-existing connection behavior. Uh, that's true. So Robert Lee at SANS made a really good presentation. I, I reference this a lot because the way he did this Prezo was so 1980s, maybe 70s. He actually brought in an overhead projector on plastic, wrote on hand, on the plastic and <laughs> showed it up. And he said, look, you have four things associated with an attack. You only need to catch two. That's why you have to look broadly. And then if I miss one because of this exclusion, that's okay, right? So let's not try to boil the ocean. Let's catch what we can. Um, and that's really the goal here. So wouldn't worry about too much. And what happens is once you find three and four, you can go back and say, why didn't I catch two? I know they did that. And then you see it in your exclude and you work through it and figure out how to how to make it sing. Oh, it looks like somebody remembered uh, Robert Lee's talk. <laughs> Hope you remember my talk. That was a good one too. I was the first one up that talked about miter attack. But that, was a, that was a heavy miter. That was a heavy miter year. Okay. And our team, our beat malware, Jake's team in the, uh, in the uh, debate, which is unheard of because that guy's don't ever debate him. He's awesome. So there was a, was there a third question? Jake Williams. Oh yeah, that guy. Do yeah. not debate yeah. him. I'm all, yeah. the only reason our team beat him. He was the only good <laughs> debater on his team. So the other three, yeah, Jake Jake single handedly carried the team, and and unfortunately not enough for the. We had a decent team, but we didn't win either. Somebody else won, but. Yeah, Mauer Jake's awesome. That guy thinks very quick, has great answers. Great resource. Uh, any more questions out there? I think you said three. Zing. <laughs> yeah, well, he's my buddy. When we used to travel, we would share each other's frequent flyer clubs. <laughs> I take enough mine and i'd go to his more time to his more than mine because houston's you know obviously he's flyer there. okay uh, so uh, were there any other questions that you wanted to put in the chat in the questions and answers section anyone else anybody else going 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 going, going. Oh, once going twice all right i'm here so for you man we're here to share okay. So what B-Side is all about. <laughs> yeah, so he'll he'll answer any of your other questions, if you think of any, you know, after the fact. Um, just uh, reach out to him uh, in the Discord. <laughs> he wants me to room. pause for a screenshot. Oh, so just go to LinkedIn or wherever else. <laughs> Splunk. Uh, everybody uses Who my said Splunk. that? I don't see oh, that. Where did he say that? Oh, it was in a ch it was in chat. Oh, a private chat. Okay. <laughs> all right. That's it. Okay. All I right. So Switch I'm up. going to call this uh, session closed. Yeah. All right. We're going to end this broadcast. And thank you so much, Mike, for vol uh, well for presenting. And uh, we'll talk to you later. Hey, I may not run B-sides anymore, but, you know, I can contribute. Yes. And, and harass Steven and sciatic nerd <laughs> for the rest of you and Fred. <laughs> Fred's a partner. So. Yeah.
<laughs> okay, yeah, I, I think I saw Fred at, uh, I met him at a different, uh, something else. I think it was for the hackers group. Yeah, yeah. I think that's it. Uh, what uh, what do I miss seeing here with the the Bass product? There's a question. So, what's your intimate relation with Bass products? I am drawing a blank on the acronym. I'm thinking I'm thinking basic man. <laughs> Bad actor. <laughs> Breach attacks. Oh, yeah. Any of these attack simulators are good because if you can at least alert or detect on these or three quarters or hopefully over half. Then it's a good place to start. Yeah. So any of them from uh, Uber's tool or Miter's or Atomic Red Canary. Yeah. Open Picas. I don't. I don't care what you use. Um, even malware generators like you get from Scythe or others. Uh, yeah. Try those. Caldera. Yeah. Yeah. Those. Those are great places to start to see if you can detect them. Obviously, Cobalt Strike would be a great way to do it, or, or DLL side loading testing. Could you detect? In WebEx, a DLL loading. Windows doesn't log DLL, for example. So how would you see that, right? So that's a trick. Sysmon. Yes, yeah, so that was a really big problem uh, with uh, the ICMP tunnel hack that just came out a, little, a few weeks ago. Uh, yeah, so network traffic, for example, DLL. DNS yeah. tunneling. Uh, it's a text record, and it shouldn't be very long. So the Chinese WinNTI group used it in gaming, and we had a, a uh, alert on it that said anything over like whatever 120 or 200 characters alert us and that's how we caught the dns tunneling it's also how we found open dns did not block the dns tunnel record when you blocked a domain so we had opened up a ticket for the that was that was a drag we thought we blocked them and there it is the traffic still going Shh, not beating up the vendor sure they fixed it by now cisco owns them must be better. So yeah, Cobalt Strike or any of the other attack platforms, play with them, create uh, benign payloads and execute them. Uh, also, odd locations, program data, root of uh, program files, x86, app data local, app data local roaming. Malwaring and sort of the red teams drop these payloads in the root of directories that have no files. And so it sticks out like a sore thumb to an instant responder. Because that stuff, there's nothing to execute from there, right? It's it's C program files, seven zip, seven zip M or seven zip, whatever dot exe, not program files something dot exe. Which one attacker used? It was a Cobalt Strike payload. They called seven z dot exe in the root of program files. Like nope, fail. So yeah, Cobalt Strike uh, example. But thanks, good questions. Let me know if you got any more. I'm out. Okay. All right. I'm going to end the broadcast, and thank you so much. Woohoo. Okay. <laughs>